This morning's scripture reading will come from Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love thy Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I'm thankful to be here with you not only this morning, but this week. I have a lot of memories of, uh, of this congregation and of you. Uh, in fact, you, you may not remember this, but uh, way back in 1992 when we started studying in the Memphis School of Preaching, you helped us attend that school. Uh, so uh, we've always been thankful for you. Uh, my wife wonders if you're responsible for me from time to time, and I tell her yes. Uh, that's how I got this way. But no, we are, uh, we are thankful to be with you this week. You know, as I look back on my life, I'm, I'm humbled. Uh, I'm humbled by the, the blessings uh, that God has provided into my life. I have been blessed more than, than I believe any man deserves to be blessed, much less than I myself deserve to be blessed. And I'm humbled by these blesses, blessings not because I, I think that I've made bad choices or something like that. I, it's not that I don't believe that I have worked hard or that I have sacrificed. It's not that. It's just that, well, I, knew, I know too much about myself not to be humbled. I know who I am. And contrasting who I am with who God wants me to be puts me in a place where I cannot help but be, but be humbled. I mean, when I compare the kind of father that I am, uh, the kind of husband that I am, the kind of father and friend and preacher that I am versus the father, friend, preacher, husband that God wants me to be, and I know that I'm, I'm not that. And I want you to understand, I, I don't have self-esteem issues. That's not the problem. Anybody that knew me growing up, you, you already know that's not the problem. No, that's not the problem at all. The problem is that at this point in my life, I have not yet become what I believe that God had in mind when he formed me in the womb. But I know this. I know that God has been painting in my life. And I know that what he has painted so far is a long ways from what I was before. And I know that God will continue to paint in my life if I allow him to do so. And that's what this sermon series this week is about. We're going to go through this idea of God being able to create a masterpiece out of our lives. And I know if you've seen the flyers, you've probably been wondering where in the world this is going to go. And I'm not going to explain all of it this morning, but each lesson that we have this week is going to be another piece in helping us understand this idea of of this masterpiece, of allowing God to paint in our lives, because what I understand is we're in a situation. I am a guest. I realize I grew up here, and, and I have a lot of family here even, and, and I have old friends that are going to be around this week, I, I know, because they've communicated with me through the Internet. I know all of that, but I'm still a guest. And you have an eldership, and you have deacons, and you have Barry, and, and, and they work here all year long. And I'm going to be here for a few days, and I'm going to leave, and they're going to have to clean up whatever's left behind. And so I figured this week what I should do, rather than, rather than come in and try to pick a specific topic and, that, that maybe Barry would do a better job with, because he knows you even better than I do, that maybe what I ought to do this week is motivate us. That I should create in us or help create in us this desire to really become what God wants us to be. And then that will happen as we work week by week or as you work week by week continuing from this place forward. I want to know how to allow God to make in me and make of me a masterpiece. And I want to say this. I, I have worked hard. I have worked hard in preparing these uh, these lessons, and I know that there's a tendency, and I haven't been here in a long time, maybe you're the exception, 
But the tendency is, we have a really good attendance this morning. I don't know what the number is. I don't even know what this auditorium holds. But this looks like a really good attendance uh, this morning. Maybe that's because we have a potluck in a minute. Uh, maybe we'll have a little less this afternoon. But I know the tendency is that tomorrow night we're going to have even less. And then Tuesday night's going to be our low point. And then Wednesday night we'll have a good crowd again. I want to motivate us today to not let that happen. And I don't want to motivate us not to let that happen because I think that I have something special to, in being here. I don't, I don't believe that at all. I just want to motivate us because these lessons have changed me. These lessons have helped me to see where God works in my life and where he wants to work in my life. And I want that for you too. So I hope you'll be here for every lesson because what we're talking about is allowing God to paint. And I'm going to be open about my inadequacies. And I'm going to challenge you to be the same. I don't want you to listen to a lesson and think about your spouse sitting next to you, that they needed that one. I don't want you to look at somebody sitting in another pew and say, well, I sure am glad they were here for that one. I want you to look in a mirror as I am going to do myself. And I want you to be brutally honest with yourself. I want you to be honest about where you have been. I want you to be honest about where you are right now. And I want you to be honest about what God has the ability to do with you. And this morning's lesson is our introduction. And I want to start with this idea of figuring out where are we? Where am I? See, I cannot allow God to paint in my life unless I first know where I am. And I want to talk about Israel because, see, I think that over time, mankind has not really changed. We can look at Israel or anybody else, and especially the Old Testament accounts. We look at Adam and Eve and say, well, I wouldn't have eaten that fruit. Well, we would have. And we say, well, I, I wouldn't have complained about the manna every day. We, we would have. I mean, we haven't changed. Mankind hasn't changed. We see who God is and what God has done, and we're still who we are. It's amazing how consistent we have been. And so as I look back at Israel, I can see us. And I think about Israel, and I see God bringing them out of captivity. And I see him leading them, even across the sea, to a mountain called Sinai. And at the base of this mountain, God, God provides for them a law. And he makes them a people. He makes them a, be, a, a, a nation. And he says, I will be your God if you'll just agree to follow me. And he instructed them in the very beginning of the Ten Commandments, which are the foundation for the law. He instructs them in Exodus 20 and verse 3. He said, you shall have no other gods before me. And there's a reason that that's first. The reason that's first is because if they don't get that right, nothing else is going to matter. God's going to give them not only the Ten Commandments, but he's going to give them the law. The Ten Commandments are not the law. They're a foundation. And then the law builds upon that. And so he gives them all of this law, and it's worthless to them if they don't get this first part right. Because that's their foundation. They can never be the people God wants them to be without that foundation. And so I see that, and that helps me understand what went wrong as they moved forward. And then some 40 years later... It was 38 years from the time that they left Mount Sinai, but some 40 years from the time that they leave Egypt. They're at, the, they're at the border of this land of promise, and they have seen thousands and thousands of funerals, of deaths, because these people just didn't listen to God. And so they're standing at that border, and now they know that Moses is about to die himself. And he provides for them the law again. He states it again. That's the book of Deuteronomy. He states it again, and in the book of Deuteronomy, he says to them, and these are, these are some last words from Moses before he's going he's gonna to leave them. In Deuteronomy 6, beginning in verse 4, we read this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Do you hear something there? Do you hear God saying to them, I have got to be 
everything. I gotta be a, I gotta be everything. I've got to be in every part of your life. God's not supposed to be in this little section of existence over here or this little section of existence over there. He's supposed to be every part of their life. And so I know that. And I look at what happened with Israel and where everything went wrong and how they struggled, and I know it's because they just didn't do it. They just didn't make God a complete part of their lives. They said to him, Oh, we'll follow you. We'll keep your commandments. We'll do what you ask us to do. We will have no other gods before you. And then they failed. And I know why. It's the same reason we fail. It's because they had compartmentalized their lives. They were like a pot, potluck plate. We're good. I don't even know what kind of plates you have, but I, I would venture to say these are probably back there. You've seen potluck plates. It's a paper plate that's got dividers in it. And so this great big section up here is either for dessert or meat. And then this little bitty section over here is for vegetables because you don't want the vegetables to touch the meat or the dessert. And so you have a potluck plate. Israel did that with their lives, and we do that with our lives. We have a spiritual life compartment, and then we have a work life compartment, and then we have a hobby life compartment, and then we have a take care of family compartment, and we make sure that all of them stay nice and neatly separated. And then what happens is one day I wake up and I think, you know what, I need to be I need to be closer to God. I need to be more spiritual. And it's like going on a diet. It doesn't work. Because I'm just working on one little section of my plate. And the rest of it's all just untouched. The truth is our spiritual lives are our lives. God has never been interested in man's spiritual life. God has always been interested in our lives. And the same thing is true today. The same thing. Our scripture reading a while ago was actually a reference back to what Moses stated in Deuteronomy. So it was stated to us as well in the New Testament in Matthew 22, beginning in verse 39, when he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he's not saying there's only two things you've got to do to be right with God. Just love everybody. It's not what he's saying at all. He's saying if you love everybody, you will do what God says. He won't be a compartment in your life. He will be everything because you don't have a spiritual life you have a life does that help you understand why in matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 jesus could say seek ye first the kingdom of god and all and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you life these things life god will take care of if if he and his kingdom the church is everything There's no spiritual compartment. There's no compartments in your life. God's not in your spiritual life. And he's not interested in being in your spiritual life. He's interested in being in your life. And I will always be disappointed in myself if there's a portion of my life that I have segregated off so that God doesn't touch that part. You know, I'll give him Sunday morning from 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock. And I might give him Sunday night from 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock. And if I'm really radical... I'll give him Wednesday night, but Monday belongs to me, and Tuesday belongs to me, and God needs to stay down there at the church building. If that's where you are, he can't paint. If that's where you are, he will never make a masterpiece out of you, not because of his lack of ability, but of your lack of willingness to let him have the brush. So I know where I am. I know the struggle now. I need to know how do I embrace this? How do I, how do I embrace the fact that I, I want God to make something out of me, that I want him to use me, that I want him to paint in my life? Have you ever considered why it is that fairy tales have been so successful in our world? <clears throat> why is it that, that fairy tales just grab everybody's attention, that everybody knows about it? Children, you know, we want to decorate their rooms. We want to buy them the movies. We want to have them to wear costumes about all these fairy tales. Why? Why is it such a, a big deal? Well, I think it's this. I think it's because for just a moment, 
I can imagine that something that is less than ideal can become something better. You know, for just a moment, I can believe that a frog can become a prince. For just a moment, I can believe that an ugly duckling can become a beautiful swan. For just a moment, I can believe that a puppet can become a real boy. And none of it has to, has to end at midnight because the glass slipper fits. We just want to believe there's something more out there. And I'm saying to you this morning that in that sense, the gospel is kind of like a fairy tale except for it's real. That God can actually take something that is less and make something wonderful. That God can take something that I have marred, that I have scarred, and even with those imperfections that he can paint a masterpiece. See, here's the thing. The good news is that since there is an empty tomb, since Jesus did resurrect from the grave, he can make something better of me. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. There's a passage in Ephesians chapter 2 that I believe that we don't uh, maybe emphasize as much as we should. And maybe it's because sometimes we don't understand it. Maybe it's because it's just been so radically abused in the religious world today. But Ephesians chapter 2, there's a, there's a writing by Paul there. Well, the whole book's by Paul. But what Paul's trying to say there is significant about God's grace, but it's not a conversion account. That's the way we read it. That's the way we apply it. But it's not a conversion account. Let's read it first. Ephesians 2 verses 8 through 10. Here's what he says. He says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For, now if you were in Stuart, I would tell you that's a connecting word. That means it's a conclusion to or a continuation of what he's already said. So he says, you are saved by grace, and it's not because you're so wonderful or whatever. But here's what it means. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This passage was written to people who have been saved. It's not a conversion account. What it is, is a transformation account. He says, because of the fact that God has saved you, you need to become something. You are his workmanship. That word there, workmanship, is the original word poema. And that's probably not pronounced right. I don't think it matters. I just tell you that to say this. That word poema can be translated canvas. Such as the canvas that beginning blank becomes a beautiful masterpiece in the hands of the artist. Paul is saying here, you are nothing and yet, when you become a Christian, that God has the ability to take that canvas that is your life and make something beautiful. Several years ago, Terry and I went on a cruise. It was our first cruise. Uh, and uh, we didn't know what happened on cruises. I have since learned that what you do is you eat. That's a cruise. If you want to take a good vacation, take a cruise because you're going to eat. I love eating. But we also learned, we went to the top of the ship one day, and there was a big crowd, and I've got to find out what's going on. So I start working my way through this crowd, and I get there, and there's this guy just walking in a circle. He's got a hat on, and he's just walking in a circle, and he's just looking at a block of ice. It's just a raw block of ice. And he walks around that thing for about a minute, maybe two minutes, and he stops. And then he steps up, and he starts going crazy. I mean, he's got awls and hammers, and he is just wailing on this block of ice and in a matter of about four minutes that raw block of ice became an Indian head sculpture. What I'm saying to you is that what, that's what Paul's talking about. Paul says when I allow God to work he can take this raw block of whatever I am and make something beautiful out of it. Turn to Romans 6. Here's another passage that says a similar thing. Romans chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. 
how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we, sh we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Again, this is not a... This is not a new birth account. It's not a conversion account. It does describe this new birth, but he's writing to people who are Christians. And what he's saying is by implication, when you became a Christian, you became the canvas that God would work on. You transform from that point forward. You become something. You become what God desires for you to be. You die to self. You're resurrected to walk. A new life. That means God can paint. It means God can make something out of me. So how? I need to know the key to all of this. What does it mean? How do I get to this place? I mean, I, I feel that I want to help. I want God in my life. I want him to paint. I, I want all of that. But how does it work? Well, go back to that nation of Israel and you remember them. They were in Egypt for a very long time. As they're in Egypt, they get more and more discouraged. And, you know, after all those years, you start to say, well, I just don't think it's going to happen. I just don't know that God's going to show up and he's going to deliver us. So one day, when the descendants of Abraham had pretty much given up, a forgotten man by the name of Moses, forgotten for 40 years. He's out with the sheep of his father-in-law and he, he observes that there's a bush. And this bush is on fire. And that probably wasn't even that unique, except for the fact that this one's not being consumed. Well, that is unique. Every bush he'd ever seen in his life, and I don't know how many there were, but every bush he'd ever seen in his life that was on fire was consumed. That's what fire does. But this one was different, and he watched it, and it did not, it, it was not being consumed. And so the text tells us that Moses says in Exodus 3 3, he says, I will now turn aside and see. This great sight, why this bush does not burn. And you know what happened? Israel's history changed right there. Right there. Because this man who 40 years earlier had failed, 40 years earlier, he thought it was time to, to lead God's people out. And it just didn't work that way because he wasn't ready. Israel wasn't ready. God said it's not time. So 40 years he's been out here in the wilderness forgotten. 40 years he's been giving up. Forty years, he's had no hope, and all of a sudden, this bush is there, and he says, you know what? I need to stop and see why this is happening, and because he did that, everything in Israel's history changed. Now, I know the, the account. I know he argued. I know that he probably said, I'm a nobody. In fact, the text tells us he did say that, and I know that God basically answered him to paraphrase. God said, I know you're a nobody, but I'm not. I know that you're what you are, but you're not yet what I will make you. I'll be with you. Moses turned aside to see God. And that's why we know who Moses was. I think that's the desire that all of us had. I think we want to be better. I think that's seen in some foolish decisions we make, like joining fitness clubs. That's a foolish decision. Eating healthier, that's a foolish decision. Exercising, foolish decision. I hope you know that's sarcasm. But we do want to be better, don't we? We even commit ourselves to things that affect us spiritually. Like, I want to be better, so I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to commit to praying more, whatever it is. I'm going to, I'm going to study more. We make these commitments. And here's the thing. What I'm trying to tell you is that this account with Moses turning aside tells me that no matter where I am in life, no matter how old I am in life, no matter how many times I have failed, no matter how scarred I am, that God can still work. He can change us if I'll just turn aside to see him. I hear that in Galatians 4.19 where Paul tells the Galatian Christians that he labored with them until Christ was formed in them. That word form there 
is from the word morphu. We get our English word from that, and it means change. Paul's saying, listen, you may be ugly now, but God can change you. If you'll turn aside and spend your time in his word, God will change you. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, he talks to the Roman Christians and he says that God had long planned for them to be conformed into the image of his son. And the word there, conformed, is pseudomorphos, same root, but I use it to show that it's somewhat different. What it means is change to look like something else. Paul says, listen, if you'll take the time to focus on God's word and put it in your life, that God can make you look like his son. And then in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, one of my favorite passages in all of the Bible, he says, I beseech you or I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that word transformed is the word metamorpho. And here's what it is. It's the same root as the others, but here's what it means. It means completely transfigured or changed. Paul says, listen. If every single day your life will be a living sacrifice to God and every single day you will, you will dig into his word, turn aside and spend time in his word and put it into your life, God can completely change you. Just turn aside. You know what all this means? All this means that I can allow God to paint in my life if I'm willing to do it. And that God can create a masterpiece. But I want you to understand a really something key to this. And I'm going to get more into this this afternoon. But the key to this is not about doing the right things. That'll happen. If you become more like Jesus, you will do the right things. But that's not what this is about. This is about who I am. This is about me being the right kind of person. If I turn aside and I allow God to work in my life, I become the right kind of person. The canvas that is, in my, that is my life becomes a masterpiece in the hand of God. That's what I'm asking this week. The elders, uh, I am humbled by the privilege to be here this week that they have allowed me, that you have allowed me. And it's been three years coming. You may not be aware of this, but it was actually scheduled for April of 2020 in the pandemic kind of took that away. So what I'm asking you to do is what I'm doing myself this week, and that is I want to turn aside and see God. I want to spend this week turning aside into God's word and spending each night here studying it together and allowing God to paint. Now let me close with this. Christianity is more than a destination. It is true and it is right. That heaven is the destination of the Christian. And certainly that is something to motivate us to serve God in our lives. But Christianity is more than just that destination. Christianity is a life that we live here that honors our God and allows him to use us in this life. I came across a poem. It was written by Elizabeth Barrett Browning. And it's like it goes like this. It's just four lines. It said, earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush afire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit rounded and pluck blackberries. The purpose of this series is about changing my life. And it's about changing your life. And it's about allowing God to paint rather than us sit around and pick blackberries. It's allowing us to become what God wants us to become. Do you believe you can do that? Do you believe you can be more than you are today? Do you believe that with God holding the brush of your life, that he can make something out of you that will glorify him? I hope that you do. And I hope that if you don't, that you'll keep coming back. Well, I hope you're back anyway. But if you don't, don't give up this morning. Come back. Let's talk some more. Let's study some more. But let's start right now. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, and to be honest with you, as a guest preacher, 
I don't have any idea. But if you're not a Christian, I want you to understand you can be a great person. You can be a spiritual person. You can be a religious person. You can be a good person. You can know about God. You can believe in God. But he can never paint in your life until you obey him. Till you become a Christian. And it's not going to be man's plan. And it's not going to be my plan. And it's not going to be Barry's plan. The only way you're ever going to be right with God is if you follow God's plan. My plan will always leave you short. But God's plan won't. So the one who came into this world and lived his life sinlessly and died for you is saying, it's time to give me the brush. So if you're not a Christian, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you choose to turn away from your sins and repentance. You choose to confess his name before man. And you're humble enough to say, I'll die with you. You're buried in, in water. God contacts your sins with the blood of Jesus Christ himself. And he saves you. 1 Peter 3.21. Acts 22.16. Mark 16.16. 16, Galatians 3.26 and 27. Do you need more? Why not be willing to do that today? And if you're a Christian who wandered away from him, your willingness today to come home to a father who's waiting for you just waiting to paint. Let him work in your life. Whatever you need. If you need to come home, won't you come? While together we stay. <laughs>